You mentioned earlier that uh, the West is kind of in this Cold War 1.0 delusion. What do you think uh, is needed to kind of break that delusion in the West? Frankly, uh, I, I don't. I don't see it happening. It's getting worse and worse. Um, I mean, what you call wokeism, for example, is basically living in an alternate reality uh, in which the bad guy is the good guy. And some of us predicted this. I have a good research team with me. And uh, I mean, my research team dug up a lot of things that not only does the CCP propaganda make you feel the Chinese Communist Party can be made harmless, you can diffuse the, the fuse, but your country is horrible. Your people are horrible. So they make you fight. And if you check online, you'll find multiple speeches of mine, maybe some writings as well, saying about how the fringe is empowered. There are certain research that I can't really, I mean, you know, talk about because my researchers will not like it. But, I mean, it's getting worse and worse in the West to the extent to which we're getting worried about the West as a security partner. And I again repeat, I don't think anybody wants a Western soldier uh, on the ground anywhere in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan, everywhere. They've been completely, they've been what PLA soldiers are. Thank, thank, I mean, you know, thank God for the PLA soldier. They can't fight. Let's be honest. But technology is great. Intelligence is great. Your Air Force is great. Your airmen actually got different. Your Navy guys have got different things. The Army is basically about force protection. And let me tell you, Unless you're prepared to enter a live battlefield, an active battlefield, and ready to lose your life, you're not really a soldier. And you're not somebody who's an analyst either. If whether it's a terror battlefield or it's an actual battlefield, unless you enter there and you're willing to risk a bullet or a bomb or a knife thrust or whatever, a bayonet, you're not, you're not really understand what battle is all about. The Chinese soldier doesn't know what battle is all about. The Taiwanese don't know what battle is all about. Neither of them, in my view, are equipped to fight a real war the way we are, frankly. But the Taiwanese are very good at cyber. They, over the last eight years, they have done a tremendous amount of work. I'm happy, at least for the next four years, that's going to continue. And for the next four years, I think under Lai and under Bikim, they're going to really cybercharge their cybersecurity. They're going to multiply their defenses. The only problem is, you have these weak, vacillating, you know, untrustworthy, unreliable people in the West who flood Ukraine with equipment to defeat a, a power that's already gone. In the, and you have the same people niggardly, I mean, I don't want to use that word, so utterly stingy. I apologize for using that word, frankly. I'd like to say that, you know, we in India, we have stood by, for example, the ANC, we have stood by the cause of racial, this thing, this thing. But that's a word which has been commonly used to mean something, you know, uh, I mean, frankly, it's a contemptuous amount of help that you're giving Taiwan compared to what you're giving to, to, to Ukraine. It's contemptible. It's those who have, uh, you know, planned that budget are contemptible people. Those who have planned that budget and given Israel this much, when Israel is in the battle of its life, when Israel is fighting a battle of existence and finally they realize that, I mean, they never realized that about Gaza. Some of us warned some of our friends that this is happening. For God's sake, these guys are 100 times more virulent. Don't think it's the West Bank, it's Gaza. Oh, well, you know, we can tackle that. But anyway, forget that. What are we giving Israel? Nothing. Compared to what are you doing to Ukraine? $60 billion. You cut that money. Make it $10 billion, $20 billion, $40 billion you used to defend your southern border. You have to defend your southern border because God alone knows how many people are coming in from CCP, from Wahhabism, from Khomeini's. All three will be coming in. Maybe one in 20. Maybe one in 50. But even one in 1,000 is too much. So spend 40 billion on defending the southern border. I mean, Donald Trump says build a wall, build a barrier. Yes, please. And why? I, the only point I difference I got with Nikki Haley She's completely, you know, I think either for winning the elections or not, she's become totally Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. You know, Ukraine conflict is about democracy, civilization. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Was France not a democracy or Britain or America or, you know, New Zealand? Ukraine, I mean, 
It was they had a they had a it was part of the Soviet Union. What happened? If Ukraine is so central to democracy in the world, why wasn't it affect democracy affected when it was part of the USSR? How is democracy affected now when uh, 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 about a fifth of it is now in Russian control? And unless it's taken back, democracy will collapse. Is your democracy so fragile? If Taiwan is taken over, believe me, nobody will believe in the West. As it is, after seeing this ignominious retreat from Afghanistan, after seeing the Kurds go under the bus, after seeing people you know who have stood by you in Afghanistan being executed by Taliban. By the way, India has very good relationships uh, with individual Taliban people. More than half of them send their families to India to either live securely or study here. And we have no problem with that. Northern Alliance people send, Taliban send, they don't fight each other, but we have a very flourishing Afghan community and we have Indians are quite safe in Afghanistan. We have, we have no problem with Taliban, but Taliban is certainly not a pro-Western uh, power. It's a Wahhabi power. It's an existential danger to moderate Islam. And the greatest thing that has happened in this world is Saudi Arabia, the Al Saud, turning against Wahhabism. A man who is being demonized in the Western press, the way my Prime Minister Narendra Modi is being demonized. As a, I mean, the way Mohammed bin Salman has been demonized. Check my writing. From day one, I said this man should not be demonized. He should be celebrated because he's moved away from Wahhabism. Look. Matt, when you're when you know when you're faced Wahhabis, when you come in contact with them, when they have drawn your blood, when they shot at you, you understand what it is. Khomeini is frankly, I've never had a problem. I've never tangled with them. You, I mean, you know, Syria or wherever in any of the theaters I've gone to. But Wahhabis, yes, several times, five or six times. But you know, I mean, this is the situation you're, 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 we are talking about, and that is where our thinking is different. And Biden people cannot forgive us for, for buying into that Ukrainian strategy, that Europe counts, it's the Atlantic that counts. And frankly, the India-US relationship is good, but it could be fantastic if you had more intelligent people, intelligent about the real world, serving the White House, the NSC, CIA possibly. The, I mean, these are the guys who have fed these delusions, Ukraine, Ukraine. And it's ridiculous. Taiwan is the democracy that's essential to the free world. Because believe me, if Taiwan falls, we are all in trouble in Asia, including Vietnam, by the way, a good friend of India, by the way. Indian, Indian Vietnamese soldiers, uh, you know, we have multiple drills together. We are very close to Vietnamese. We have been from Ho Chi Minh's time. Remember, we supported Ho Chi Minh. We supported the unification of Vietnam. And, uh, I mean, you know, we, are, we have been standing together with them. So, and the West, I can tell you, people will absolutely stop believing in the West if Taiwan falls. They will, the elites will fall over each other to jump to China as this thing. Because you destroyed the only power in Eurasia, which together with India can suppress the CCP. If Russia and India come together, if the West allows that to happen, CCP is in trouble. Like you squeeze Mayor Howe of the KMT with two basically very dark blue people. A light blue guy was squeezed by two dark blue people. Russia and India squeezing PRC is going to be a sight to watch, except that it's not happening because of the strategic miscalculations of the Western world and his obsession with a war that was lost from February 24, 2022. Check my, my writings and podcasts. I've said from that day, it's ridiculous to fight uh, that this war. It's a lost war. I think I remember saying it on, on your channel as well, long back. So please, don't tell me about Taiwan and Ukraine. It's a horror story. It's, a, you know, it's what's called a cautionary tale. It's not the great, ah, uh, you know, we are, we are going to be the next Ukraine. Nobody wants to be the next Ukraine uh, who's outside an asylum. And no Taiwan. Taiwanese are one of the smartest people I've met. You know, they're not delusional. Well, thank you very much for joining us again, Professor. It's always great to get an Indian perspective on these important global events. Thank you. And I'm really delighted. I want to say I'm honored to be invited by your channel. You three are doing a fantastic job of China unscripted by the CCP, let me say. And I'm very certain there would have been multiple efforts to get at you. 
But uh, you obviously resisted all those efforts. And believe me, 40% of Taiwan is exactly like you. Even if the West is in decline, we are on the rise. And finally, the West will rise again. But you'll need India and Russia and Taiwan for that. I'm sorry. Take care. You know, I always do like having Professor Nalapan on because, you know, I think we have a problem in the U.S. where it's like we can only hear ideas and opinions that exactly align with what we already believe. Or like if something is in something you agree with, then like your back is automatically up, right? Like it kind yeah. of closes people off to like hearing uh, a different opinion. And I think it, every time we have him on, I feel like, yes, my mind is like bending in new ways because he does have a very different perspective. Yeah. And we don't have an opportunity to really hear that. Right. Like no one, in, none of our guests from the U.S. have ever said anything like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's worth developing closer relations with Russia as a counter to. Or we're CCP. good friends with the Taliban. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, individual I, Taliban. Individual. individual Taliban. Taliban. Okay. But like, yeah. It, and I agree with what you're saying. It, it, it's like it does force me at least to think about like maybe there's other ways of looking at things and. Or just to and see a just different, see, uh, just yeah. a different way of thinking. Even if you don't agree with that, even if you do think it's wrong, it's good to see these different ways of thinking, these different ways of looking at the world. Because, I mean, that that is, I think he is right about uh, many in Western institutions being stuck in Cold War 1.0, and that's because they don't challenge those worldviews by exposing themselves to different ideas. Yeah, no, I and I, I think that makes a good point. And one of the things India is doing, and I, I wish we had time for this, but but you know, India has been on the front lines of Cold War II, uh, two point in a in a special way, which is that they basically banned a whole bunch of Chinese apps, including TikTok, because they they see the CCP's role in the Cold War as being this kind of influence of the mind, this propaganda. Right, the way that. Well, yeah, I think that, he talked about that, and, you know. Yeah, but but I mean, what what he didn't mention was that was how far India has gone in stopping those things within it, the Indian borders, um, which I think is, uh, you know, deserves praise for what for you know banning TikTok, for example. Uh, it does make it easier for India to deal with the CCP when they're not constantly inundated with, you know, TikTok shorts about how evil the West is. Yeah, meanwhile, Joe Biden has a new TikTok account to, for his presidential run. Oh, the political, like politicians' TikTok accounts are always so cringe, just cringe. terrible. But it is a good, it's a good point because it's what the CCP uses to manipulate the minds of uh, young Americans. I mean, I don't want to say it's just TikTok, but it's also you know, Timu or. Temu as oh. their ads from the Super Bowl is. Well, they had, like, they had like uh, a new ad for this last Super Bowl. I think they ran it like three or four times, but it's the same thing. And what what really upsets me about the Timu ad is they keep calling it Temu, but nobody calls it Temu. They all everyone calls it Timu. That's that's my big problem. Oh, also they they use you know slave labor in their supply chains. Well, I mean those two things really bother me. No, I mean so does Nike. Well, I think the thing is that, like, it's going to be just, like, uh, I mean, I never thought I was going to have to defend, like, Amazon or Walmart <laughs> yeah. against the CCP, but this is kind of, like, what they're doing, right? Anyway. It, it's, it causes strange bedfellows, yeah. like, you know, just India like, and yeah. Russia. There you go. Yeah. Or the Taliban or Iran. India's got a lot of friends. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of feel like these are strategic friendships in the way that, you know, like Donald Trump kept getting nailed for saying things like uh, he and Xi Jinping are friends or yeah. whatever, but then yeah. not really. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, he, like he talks about like, oh, yeah, Xi Jinping came over, we had the best chocolate cake. And meanwhile, like when he is the exact moment when he is there, he like has a, a missile strike in Syria. Like that's the kind of friendship. Well, I mean, we can't speak for India, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, like, as an example of, like, you know, in politics, like, what, is, what, is, what does friendship mean? But, yeah, it is, it is very interesting to the idea that there is this, uh, we're in Cold War II, and there are plenty of people in power who are still fighting the first Cold War. And so, yeah, I would say that that, that would be my challenge to the audience is to expose themselves to ideas that make them uncomfortable like you can still disagree with them you don't have to accept them but it's it's important to like read 
things you disagree with. I think it also is important because then you, like, how do you know you really think this way unless you kind of challenge that, right? Yeah. Like, if if the only thing you read or, or think about or, like, talk to people who exactly agree with you, uh, then it definitely, it's not just that us versus them thing that you were talking about when we first started about, like, how you can't have a conversation with anyone unless they agree with you completely, but also... You know, maybe you don't know why you think about something a certain way. Like Shelly, was... I absolutely agree with you. I don't agree with you at all. I don't, I don't think we can be friends. Shut up, Matt. I can't listen to you. 